So thank you so much. Um, I am um, honored to be with you all this evening um, and to share uh, experience and perspectives from my domain, which intersects with yours um, in, on a regular basis. And I'll say more about that um, as we go along. So I have no disclosures to report, um, but I do want to thank the team of people without whom I would not be here with you all today. Um, Ortho, PMNR, um, and also I would like to give special thanks to um, Leon Fleischer, one of the, the past centuries, um, great, pianists and teachers of piano, whose own struggle with uh, vocal dystonia was um, a really important um, um, story for the field. Um, I also would like to thank Maria Lambros um, and many of the Peabody faculty who've helped us work on these performance health initiatives together. So the learning objectives for today, uh, we're gonna be talking about culture, about interprofessional team, about responsive strategies, um, and about responsibility. Um, so I won't read through each of these learning objectives. They're in your, um, your document as well, but we'll go through these things um, in, as I move through the presentation. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give some background and context for our conversation about um, uh, performing arts health um, in, 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 in a conservatory environment. Then I'm gonna talk about the stakeholders for um, keeping people healthy. Um, I'm gonna talk about the culture around health within the performing arts. I'm gonna briefly whiz through a couple of case studies just as um, potentially food for thought and discussion. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion as well. So background and context to start. So I just want to clarify my lane. I was not born dreaming of a white coat. I was born dreaming of becoming a fancy lady on stage. And my dream came true. I was a performing artist for uh, 20, close to 20 years, uh, sang opera, oratorio, art song, chamber music, um, I developed um, a, um, a practice as a teacher, applied faculty in um, um, university and also um, um, community music school. Um, and in 2015, I came to Peabody as Associate Dean for Innovation, Interdisciplinary Partnerships and Community Initiatives. So that's my background. Um, I wanna say a little bit more about that. My training is in um, applied voice, uh, repertoire studies, uh, musicology, music theory, uh, performance uh, training. Uh, my experience uh, is as a performer and studio teacher for over 20 years, uh, applied voice, vocal pedagogy, voice science, I worked as a singing voice specialist focusing on habilitation and return to performance after vocal injury. And now my experience as a leader, part of the leadership team in one of the world's um, finest conservatories. Um, while I am not myself a healthcare provider or a scientific researcher, I have intersected with both in my experience as a conservatory student, as a performer, as an applied voice faculty, taking care of pre-professional and professional singers and working as a member of a voice team, um, as an elected uh, member of the National Organization of Teachers of Singing, uh, um, entrusted with designing health-related professional development sessions for teachers of singing, and now as a conservatory associate dean in charge of developing performance health resources uh, for 750 plus instrumentalists, singers, and dancers. I've had the opportunity to collaborate with superb healthcare providers 
who specialize in elite performers in centers of excellence throughout the US. And I myself am the beneficiary of compassionate and skilled health care um, along the journey of my own performance career. And all of these situations have given me ample opportunity to observe the problem. What is the problem? Musicians are still getting injured at unacceptably high rates. And I'm sorry to say that the injury rates haven't substantially changed since the establishment of the subspecialization of performing arts medicine in the late 1980s, even with centers of excellence throughout the world um, and skilled healthcare providers and practices in performing arts medicine. So the culture of injury still persists. Uh, the culture around injury still persists in the music industry. Um, and it is, I'm sorry to say, is still perpetuated in conservatories like the one that, um, in which I work. Uh, a recent study um, among orchestral players in France that was published just last month indicated that 64% had playing related musculoskeletal pain within the last year, and 61%, only 3% less, within the last seven days. So um, we are still um, looking at what one might call an epidemic um, of uh, within the population of musicians of, of, um, of injury. Uh, moreover, student musicians are also slow to seek diagnosis and treatment. One study averaged that it's five years between, it's an average of five years between onset of symptoms and diagnosis and treatment. So what happens? Much talent is never developed or it is just lost. Students in the performing arts can't complete an academic degree and uh, faculty um, do not yet receive systematic training to assist with prevention and management of injury. So what have we done um, collaboratively with colleagues at PMNR um, and Ortho um, uh, at Peabody? To date, we've undertaken a number of initiatives um, involving treatment, education, research, and addressing culture. So with regard to treatment, uh, we now have a PT and OT clinic on site at Peabody, which is managed uh, was managed first by uh, Amanda Green and now by Andrea Lasner. Um, it offers referrals to, or it facilitates referrals to ortho, neuro, psych, and rehab psych, and physiatry. Um, the, the, um, the clinic management team have recruited a, a care team with um, extensive and nuanced background in the performing arts. And I'd like to point out that um, there's been an increase in utilization since our opening in, um, in the spring of 2018, but really um, mostly a, a, a soft opening in the spring and then a, um, a, a more formal opening in the fall of 2018. Um, we have already surpassed our FY22 numbers this year, this is not the most up-to-date graph. Um, and we've gradually, uh, with an in, uh, hiatus during the pandemic when we were not on site, um, we've had steady increase in utilization of the clinic since it opened. In addition um, um, to the clinic, we the educational initiatives have included uh, an orientation program for all incoming undergraduate students called Peak Performance Fundamentals, which provides the sessions that you see here. Um, in addition, we have um, screenings and advisement sessions um, that uh, the clinic folks offer. Um, in 2022, we offered the first joint sports medicine and performing arts medicine conference called Sidelined and Offstage, which looked, which looked at COVID's impact um, on performance training, uh, performance training and health for athletes and performing artists with a heavy emphasis on mental health um, um, 
um, issues. In addition, we have coursework that we've developed, which is available as electives to our students. So uh, we also have started a tiny research lab and hired Peabody's first postdoctoral fellow um, in performing arts, health, science, and education. With regard to culture change, we've been focused on school-wide visibility and advocacy for all of our performance health and injury prevention programs. And we've been focused on relationship and trust building with faculty over the last five years, which has resulted in more and more engagement with our programs. Forthcoming, uh, we, um, are, we will within the next two years have an expanded clinic space, which will co-locate rehab, fitness and somatic education all within one space. We will be adopting new surveillance strategies involving sound level monitoring, movement analysis, and new um, customized screening tools specific to individual instruments. We are starting a new academic department in performing arts and health um, in, June, uh, in July. Uh, we will have a new cognate and research track within our existing Doctor of Musical Arts program. And we will be taking new approaches to pedagogy informed by research and science. We will um, open a much more formal and large scale research lab in collaboration with PMNR. And right now, doctoral fellows um, to help run this lab. With regard to culture change, we are moving towards new ways of tracking attendance data and looking at to what extent um, injury factors into attendance um, and um, leaves of absence uh, for our students. We will conduct a thorough review of institutional policies and practices with an eye towards healthy behavior, healthy practices. Um, we, will, um, we are cultivating additional studio faculty who have a focus on injury prevention in piano, voice, and dance. And gradually, we are changing the model that we're operating from. Um, which has uh, up to this point really focused on um, equipping individuals to take responsibility uh, for their own um, performance health through providing them with resources. We're moving away from that individually focused model towards a more population health model uh, where we look at multiple levels of responsibility, community and institutional responsibility for healthy practice and performance. So now we're gonna to turn to the stakeholders um, in uh, performance health within the conservatory. Who are they and what are their roles and what are their responsibilities? So first and foremost, we have the students and their immediate support networks, their families and their friends. The students uh, are the ones who have to navigate this whole system and persist through to their degrees um, when they um, encounter injuries. So how, how does this, um, and they're the ones who need to be equipped with resources. Um, next, we have the medical providers, physicians and therapists um, responsible for evaluating and treating the injury or condition affecting the student's performance. They're responsible for providing documentation of injury and the treatment plan, as well as the duration of absence from playing. And they are responsible for signing off on return to participation. Next, we have administrators and leadership, and I'll use the we here because I fall into this category. We are responsible for setting school policy, academic requirements, and the class and performance calendar, all of which impacts student health and well-being. We are responsible for establishing the value of health as an institutional priority. And we are responsible for setting enrollment and retention targets and strategies, all of which intersect with health and well-being. Faculty, and here I'm gonna focus our attention specifically on studio faculty, 
they play an outsized role in this equation. They are um, frontline um, uh, care, uh, care providers and um, the most important relationship that a student has in this entire, uh, in their entire experience. I'm speaking here primarily of the musicians, um, but all of our students come to Peabody specifically to study with the faculty. That's why they come. They're recruited by um, and um, overseen by their studio faculty. The studio faculty oversee the technical progress and any challenges that happen in that area. They oversee the selection of developmentally appropriate repertoire, which is key to health and well being and smooth progress forward. Um, they are the primary mentor who, frankly, often triage an emerging industry uh, injury from their perspective and hopefully um, have the um, knowledge and awareness to send that, um, uh, that student with the emerging in injury onto the healthcare providers. They hold the, um, they are gatekeepers to the student's professional future. They have the capacity to advance the student's career through their networks, their personal and professional networks, and through their access to opportunities. What's this? This gatekeeping role is um, very important um, and influences a student's ability, a student's um, decision to disclose or not disclose health related information. Ensemble directors also play a, a large role. They are responsible for upholding the standards of group performance and developing skills in group performance. In order to do their jobs effectively, they require the full cohort to be present to accomplish uh, whatever the plan is for the day and therefore they track attendance. Um, they are focused on the quality of the whole for the most part rather than the individual well-being. So sometimes their needs are in direct opposition to the needs of individual uh, injured students, which is a dynamic we have to be aware of. Student services include student affairs staff and academic advising staff. They are responsible for, for providing support um, for student overall well-being, and they are primary advocates for students for their academic success and for their retention and persistence um, to complete their degree. Um, they liaise between faculty and student when necessary. They liaise between the healthcare provider and the student and the faculty, and they are the ones who usually manage the return to participation. Other stakeholders may include, include allied health, such as massage therapists, Alexander Technique, and, um, and um, other somatic educators, um, personal and professional mentors who lie outside of school, um, student employers, which may or may not be performance related activity in performance related activities and other conservatory staff. So you can see there are a lot of stakeholders in, in this um, game. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about the culture around health in the performing arts. So just remember, so this is Carnegie Hall. Um, this is one of the intended um, outcomes of a degree at a place like Peabody is that you would make it to the stage of places like this, right? So Carnegie Hall um, is itself a legacy institution within the performing arts. Um, and there are strong legacies within performing performance training that of historical traditions and craft that are passed down from generation to generation. Um, there is the adoption of a canonic uh, body of repertoire and performance practices associated with it that aspiring professional musicians must, must respond to, master and adhere to in their, own, um, in their own performance. And then there is this one-on-one -on -one master and apprentice relationship, which is part of the inherited tradition for better and for worse. 
Moreover, we've inherited um, a number of uh, instrument designs from the late 19th and early 20th century that may be mismatches for the this, this, uh, range of sizes of bodies of existing performers, uh, the students. So we may have a setup right there, um, a size differential that's um, really very difficult to overcome. So that's the legacy. Then we have the pursuit of what I would say is an unattainable ideal of perfection, right? Um, that is, um, you know, that re it revolves around the effort and time needed to build elite performance skill. Many of our musicians have been playing their instruments since they were four years old. So they've, they've already had a lot of years um, going into this. Um, and then we have the issue of uh, perfectionism, the pursuit of perfection often breeds perfectionism, which then often causes anxiety and tension, both mentally and physically. Um, and often this pursuit of perfection is bred and um, 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 carried out in isolation. Conservatories themselves are designed as incubators and the iconic space of incubation is the practice room, the photograph of which you see there. Um, at Peabody, um, um, this is um, affectionately called the pea bubble. Um, this is by design. It takes years to build these skills. But let's compare this to sports for a section, for a second. Um, the primary relationship here is with the teacher. They spend one hour a week with their teacher. The rest of the time they spend in all of their performance classes, in rehearsals, and hours and hours alone each day, unsupervised in the practice room. Anywhere between two and potentially eight or nine hours a week practicing on a, a day, I'm sorry, what am I saying? A day uh, practicing um, on their own in isolation. This means that much of the learning process is uh, personal, private, it's not shared, which does not create an, an ideal situation for creating dialogue, um, a shared community and broad support. And I think um, we can see how perfectionism and isolation together are not um, a good recipe for mental health. So then we've got the culture of no pain, no gain, which I'm sorry to say still persists in our, um, in our environment. The attitude still exists that suffering and overworking are somehow noble and necessary um, to uh, become an elite performer. Um, and that more is better, and that working harder uh, versus working smarter um, are um, the best approach. And while I would certainly uh, posit that decatastrophizing injury is a helpful strategy, normalizing pain is not. What this results in is uh, because of this isolation and fear of um, reprisal in one way or another with career futures. Um, there is a tendency for students to blame themselves for their injuries, uh, particularly injuries that develop slowly over time. Um, I didn't practice right. I did this to myself. Um, that blame causes shame, which can further uh, cause um, isolation and non-disclosure. So then we've got the overall competitive nature of the field. So um, regardless of what happened um, to us all um, as artists and arts, um, uh, arts organizations um, during the pandemic and since the pandemic, which, all of which has not been a positive story, even before that, there was a recognized scarcity of full-time positions. Um, professionally, one study showed that the, um, the odds of getting a position um, as a music grad in an orchestra are 0.05%. 0.05% of music grads land an orchestral position. 
Um, we also have the, um, the issue that academic positions are also um, scarce. Um, the economic fragility of the original gig economy, right, that came from artists, um, that, that's the model that we use to talk about the gig economy of lift workers and peace workers now. Um, in, in, you don't get benefits, and if you do not perform, you do not get paid. So this is um, quite precarious, a situation. Um, which further drives the stigma of disclosing injury and the fear of being replaced as a freelancer. Um, and this is all on top of the fact that folks graduate, um, often graduate um, with a high loan burden um, from their degree programs. So then we've got the issue of access to um, healthcare. If you're not, if you don't have a full-time position, you may not, you may be um, under or um, uninsured, right? Um, you may not um, be able to find or have access to specialized personalized care from providers who understand the arts and your work. Um, you may have challenges finding reputable providers outside of major urban areas. There's also um, a mistrust of medicalization of injury, which persists in the performing arts culture. There's a fear of surgery, fear of the knife, um, there because it potentially could result in a career ending um, injury. Um, there are folks who've had bad experiences with doctors um, who have been generalists rather than specialists. Um, or doctors whose treatment plans um, are based in no way on the reality of these folks' um, livelihoods and daily lives. Um, so all of this results in self-prescribing and self-care, mostly by turning to, to allied health providers, chiropractors, um, massage therapists, uh, Alexander Technique providers, all of which may be helpful. Um, certainly more helpful than Dr. Google, which is the other source. Um, and I also would just like to note that um, the our population of students is international, comes from a variety of different cultures, mm -hmm. and there are cultural differences regarding attitudes towards medical care um, and um, interactions with doctors. So all of that um, influences um, um, how folks, um, the, the attitudes towards uh, medical care. Um, then there's mental health issues affecting performance health um, culture. Uh, the prevalence of mood disorders amongst creatives, um, the, the prevalence of things like low self-esteem and imposter syndrome, um, substance use and abuse, the, the um, commonality of that within the performing arts community. Um, very few high quality mental health resources, specifically performance psychology resources available. Um, the challenges of um, managing, a, the, the mental health challenges of managing a career as a self-employed artist. Um, and then the self-identity challenges related to injury. If I'm not able to perform, who am I personally and professionally? So the relationship uh, between performer and instrument, the relationship between this concept of self and concept of self uh, prof uh, professionally is um, highly charged um, in, um, in the issue of injury. Um, look, finally, I'd just like to add that career satisfaction is also a factor here that I think we need to think about that may influence um, health behaviors among artists. Um, there can be um, a real kind of existential questioning of sense of purpose. Am I able to make an impact in the world through this thing that I've sacrificed years and years to developing the skills to become, is it worth it? Um, and then there's the issue of job satisfaction scores. There are many studies among orchestral players that indicate that job satisfaction scores are actually extremely low. 
So when you come into conservatory, your uh, hoped for outcome is that you become a soloist at the front of stage, or you win one of these coveted orchestral jobs. Then when you get into them, in fact, job satisfaction um, turns out to be quite low. Um, all of this results in musicians, um, and this is um, a musician playing actually at the bedside of Johns Hopkins Hospital in a program that I run, um, seeking places to find a sense of self-worth, um, the ability to make a direct impact, um, to experience a sense of connection with their audiences, um, and to have the sense that they are bringing value to the world. And the slide in the um, previous, this is actually the cellist of Sarajevo, um, who um, uh, played um, amidst the bombing um, that was taking place um, during um, that um, military um, occupation. So all of these things uh, influence um, the culture around health uh, widely within the performing arts. Within our campus, we have a whole host of other issues, academic requirements. So just to let you know, we have over a thousand performances a year on our campus. Our halls are booked all the time. Um, academic requirements that involve playing or singing or dancing involve lessons, coachings, studio and departmental performance classes, repertoire classes, pedagogy classes, chamber music classes, rehearsals for large ensembles, um, and then academic performance requirements also include um, degree recitals, um, semester and juries, um, large ensemble performances, which are part of the requirements, major vocal productions if you're a singer in opera and chorus. Then folks take um, um, part in master classes and residencies with visiting artists. Throughout the world, outside of their academic, um, um, their uh, academic um, activities. Um, they may also be active and employed outside of school in community-based learning opportunities like the hospital one I just showed you, or church jobs, weddings, restaurant gigs. I see our jazz players all the time when I go out to restaurants. They may be taking place, uh, taking part in external concerts, um, and they may be teaching um, X number of hours per week. All of this um, is part of how they afford their degree um, and uh, expand their professional opportunities, but it also increases their load, their daily, weekly load. Okay, so now how does all of this intersect? How do we see these multiple levels of responsibility and perhaps the lack of coordination between these multiple um, roles and responsibilities playing out in student injuries? So I'm going to whiz through these, um, these bear much further study and um, explanation. But um, the first one is actually mostly a success story. So um, this is the integration of performance health resources into a brand new department that was begun in 2018, the Dance BFA program. It's a small department and the department chair is able to supervise the health of each individual dancer, and she does with great fierceness um, and, and love and care. Um, she established the requirement of screening every student at the beginning of each academic year. So we have baselines. Um, uh, the clinic PT, which is Andrea, is also an adjunct faculty, and she attends all department meetings. So there's great communication on injury management so that faculty can make accommodations as needed. So what's the problem? They've got a clinic, they've got all of this support integrated into their department. Many of the undergraduate students are not on the university's health insurance plan and they have barriers to the, the care that's available to them um, at the clinic because their insurance doesn't cover it. So that's one, one kind of problem. Second situation, um, there was a change in uh, policy um, in, in recitals um, 
um, that had an impact on injury management. So our recital calendar is extremely full and cancellations are quite difficult to accommodate. So um, in order to put the, to minimize this, the concert office instituted a new fee for date changes that was assessed to the students in order to try to, to keep a lid on how many re rescheduling they had to do. But students don't always uh, have the funds to pay the extra fee or for the tuition for an extra semester if they have to postpone into the next semester. So they go ahead with the performance on the scheduled date, even if they're injured, which does not help um, um, their injury resolve. Third uh, scenario. So um, during the pandemic, we had to change pre the practice of the vocal accompanists. So normally vocal accompanists play for students voice lessons on a weekly basis, and then they're ready to play for the student recitals because they've learned the repertoire with the teacher over the course of the semester. However, during the pandemic, all the, um, the, the lessons were held um, either um, virtually or in a low latency situation where, so the pianist was not in the room. So the piano accompaniments had to, had to be pre-recorded um, and they had to learn the entire semester's literature quickly and have it performance ready at the beginning of the term. Moreover, the cohort of eight accompaniments um, fell to five due to pandemic related illnesses and leaves of absence. So five accompanists took on the work of eight accompanists. Um, consequently, overuse injury resulted in four out of those five accompanists. So the question is, who's responsible and what needs to be coordinated in order to keep um, those um, situations or to mitigate those situations um, as they arise? So I'm going to outline a little bit about um, future state. If if I can wave my magic wand as um, uh, as a fairy. Uh, uh, this is what I would ask for. Um, and I'm happy to say that some of this may come to pass. But what would it be that is needed to create a, a permeating culture of a healthy performance within the conservatory that would allow all students to thrive as they pursue their degrees and beyond into their careers? So this is a very sort of hodgepodge list, um, but I'm just gonna run through it. Um, we would have an internal data collection and reporting systems to monitor in real time the effectiveness of all of these um, strategies that we're, um, that we're utilizing so that we could um, ad uh, ad uh, adapt them as needed. Um, there would be seamless health insurance integration for clinic services. There, we, we would adopt um, a team model of multidisciplinary support around each student. I like to think of this as moving from the one-on-one -on -one studio, you know, apprentice uh, teacher model towards a pit crew model, where you actually have a number of people surrounding each student. That kind of opening out of the, of the um, care support um, would hopefully um, help nurture open dialogue about healthy practices and health management through workshops and support groups and informal conversations. Um, we would um, we would develop we will develop academic coursework, um, including evidence based pedagogy and performance health uh, in and injury um, prevention coursework. Um, we would adopt thorough and consistent institutional policies that support students' health and well-being. Uh, we would have accessible instruments of multiple sizes to fit individual bodies that would be available for practice and performance. We would have scheduling that allows adequate time for rest and integration of all the different types of learning that take place in the conservatory. 
Um, we would have sufficient specialized mental health resources to address both ongoing mental health issues and performance specific needs. We would have robust professional development opportunities for faculty that would um, um, train them in health promotion, health advocacy, and injury prevention strategies. And we would have a, um, the whole campus would serve as a laboratory for research um, with sound level monitoring, uh, movement, um, uh, uh, motion capture in our performance spaces and, and rehearsal spaces and practice spaces, as well as wearable devices for self monitoring. So that's a lot. I went through a lot, um, but I hope that gives you a sense um, of our culture, of our practices, of the various people that are really key um, in um, helping to um, participate in um, preventing injury, managing injury, and returning to um, activity. Um, and I'm hoping that it spurred some thoughts in your own minds about, about the issues and potential systemic solutions that you may see. Um, and I'm also wondering um, what you may have learned here that may influence how you treat performing artists. So I'm gonna take down the slides and hopefully we'll have some discussion. Sarah, that was incredible. I thank you for opening up my eyes to the, to the life <clears throat> of a student performer. Um, now I, I'm gonna use my world of sports and at least in the collegiate level, we have the NCAA is supposed to be governing how we treat our athletes. I'm not sure they always do a great job. In fact, I think sometimes they're the problem. But I would think that if you have an institution like Peabody and you have somebody with your vision that you create an environment where there's wellness at all levels, not only in your performance, but there, that, you know, that would be a, um, a recruiting tool for you to get some of the best performers and that success would breed success. Um, because I, I you know I think the old days in sports me medicine where you just rub dirt on it and go out and play again it doesn't work in, and I'm sure it's the same in in um, in, in in your field. Um, but I, I think what you're trying to do and what you're putting together is very very uh, exciting, and uh, I think uh, hopefully we have some role in that. Thank you so much, John. I'd love to respond to your comment about the NCAA as a governing body for better or for worse. Um, we have no analogous situation in the performing arts, which is one of the big holes within the overall picture. That's another stakeholder that should really be in our stakeholder list, right? We have recommendations that have been co uh, co um, produced by the National Association of Schools of Music and also the Performing Arts Medicine Association, but there are only recommendations for adoption. Um, and so it, they, they do not have teeth. Um, and so this is really a problem. Um, and you know, one of the things that I hope if this whole initiative really takes off, um, the Healthy Campus Initiative that we're trying to model for the, for the industry, and for our field um, that we might be able to um, advocate for and, and, and create um, some sort of um, collegiate standards that would um, parallel to some extent um, what the NCAA has done. Um, and also just to comment on your recruitment um, question, um, I would certainly defer to Andrea and Sarab here as well, but it's my experience that we <laughs> are seeing more and more students who indicate that their interest in Peabody is um, in no small part due to the provision of this level of support um, and also learning about injury and training about um, health promotion. Um, and I think that's really, I know that's only going to increase when this new department um, and new research lab begin. The other thought I had is that 
when we get them as collegiate students, um, is it too late? Are they already injured or they have things that we should have addressed when they're four years old or five years old or six years old? I see Sarap nodding um, avidly. I mean, you know, you have to unlearn and relearn. Um, that's a lot. That actually happens pretty um, pretty commonly when folks move from high school to college um, level, conservatory level training, is that there, there's a um, reworking of a number of habits. Um, and we have the chance to kind of reset the bar um, and, and also introduce into that relearning some motor learning strategies, right? Some um, sort of parameters of what load should look like, rest recovery guidelines, diet, sleep, nutrition, hydration, all of those things, which may or may not have been part of their pre-collegiate um, training, right? So we have a real opportunity, but yeah, there is, I certainly know as a former studio teacher, there's some, um, it, it's not a very pleasant way to call it, but some retreads, right? You know, you have to really work sometimes to reroute uh, entrenched habits. I think that's where we've had a challenge of like screening the musicians, like before, you know, with athletes starting their season, they usually have to go through a preseason screen. Um, and so that's where, like with the dancers, we've seen a lot of things come out that way. Um, cause we do ask them, you know, have you, what kind of injuries have you been dealing with in the past? Or if there are certain things, if they're returning in subsequent years of, you know, did anything happen over the summer? What's going on? Um, there's really no way with the musician side, um, that we've been able to formalize to know kind of where they're at, um, on the musculoskeletal piece versus kind of the pedagogy side of, of training, of relearning and un, untraining bad habits, so. Yeah, I just wanna pick up on that, Andrea, thank you. And Andrea and Sarap know full well that we've been unable as of yet to institute any requirement for screening among, I mean, that really needs to be, um, we need to make sure that the faculty um, are um, on board with this um, rather than mandating it. Um, and so there's been this sort of, you know, continual um, outreach to the faculty. Um, I think, you know, where we are now, things are um, really moving in a good direction. If we are able, um, if our really capable team is able to develop uh, instrument specific or instrument family specific screens um, that clearly um, test the kinds of movements that are used um, in playing, I think our faculty are gonna have put a lot more um, stock in those screens. We're hoping that we can actually co-develop them with the faculty so that they can they can be part of that process. Yes, I, I'd like to interject there. Um, there is a, a, a really um, pressing need to engage faculty in all this if we're going to move towards instrument-specific screening um, that we will not only need their help and approval that, that as they're part of the, one of the major stakeholders that um, we would also need to impose uh, upon the faculty that uh, the responsibility in doing this and um, the benefits of having a healthy studio, not only for the students, but for them too. What that, um, Sarap, what you've highlighted um, is something that I haven't mentioned yet, which is that the job description of a studio faculty member is very amorphous. And the training that studio faculty receive is really, frankly, um, based mostly upon this inherited tradition of performance practices. It involves perhaps some pedagogy, um, but it, there's nothing um, systematically required of performance faculty who have this outsized influence and find themselves responding to all kinds of different needs, many of which they're not equipped to address. 
And because this relationship is so primal on both sides, to be perfectly honest, I can, I can speak from my own experience as a studio faculty member, I have a huge amount of investment in my students' success and how my students are viewed um, in, in the world. Um, and um, because of this dyadic relationship, um, it is often very difficult for the studio faculty member to say, I can't do this for you, but I know somebody who can, right? To open out that relationship towards more of this pit crew model that there's a number of people, but psychologically and professionally, um, that can be a very difficult challenge for the studio faculty member. But I must say, I think we are changing that culture. There was, a, there were a few students this semester who came to me and said, "Oh yeah, my teacher said ask Sarah whether we should do this." So there is like a some sort of a relationship uh, happening outside of that. This is my studio, and I'm responsible, and you know I must do everything for them. It, it is changing. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> Perseverance, that's the name of the game. <laughs> I'm interested, yes, please, Ken. I was just gonna say, I mean, I think so much of what you're talking about, I mean, for the, the sports medicine folks on the call, it, you know, much of the culture that you're talking about has been well-established and we all grew up with it. You know, I mean, if, if you played sports in high school 40 years ago, you know, yeah, it was you, you did screens and physicals and and things like that and I, I think you know it's I think what you're what you've embarked on at, at Peabody is really working on a, a sort of a generational I mean I think it's going to take a while before it becomes mainstream because so much of it is what the work that you're doing now with the 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 college um student performers are you know they're going to eventually go out and become faculty themselves one day and i think it's going to be a quite a, a while to to for this washout to occur um that, that, no, i don't mean this to sound discouraging but i mean i think that's just you know it, i think it's more to underscore just the monumental undertaking that that you know you all have embarked on and i i, I think it's I'm very grateful to be a part of it because it, it will make it will make generational changes. Thank you. It is it's um, it takes multi. Um, we're working on this from so many different angles, right? And I think one of the new angles for us is to really think about frame it within a public health lens, um, and you know think about it as health advocacy, health promotion. Um, and I think that is going to yield some different strategies and tools for us uh, and frameworks. Um, we've been doing a lot of this, frankly, organically. Um, and um, so really leaning on some of the, the wisdom that you all already have in terms of population health um, surveillance um, and, um, and advocacy work um, is going to be I, I think it's gonna really help us up our game um, and also help provide a model for our industry and our field um, and as academic um, music and dance um, trainers. You know, what you made me think about Ken is you all have governing bodies, which, you know, um, e even beyond the collegiate level that, that um, govern acceptable, um, parameters, right? Um, and um, when we were working um, to take some of the coursework that we that Sarap has um, developed to uh, professional orchestras, we actually also, we went to a service organization called the League of American Orchestras, thinking that they, because they broker sort of between industry and um, players, um, thinking that maybe this would be something that their membership might be interested in having access to. Um, and what we learned is that um, health issues are used as bargaining chips by both sides 
in collective bargaining agreements. Yep. And that means that nobody wants to touch it. So we can't get that, you know, so there's that structural problem as well. Um, so legislation, policy, that's a level that we need to be working on as well. Well, thank you again. Uh, I re really appreciate you doing this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you, like many uh, the rest of us, have all had a very long day. So uh, I, I thank you for giving us your time and expertise. And uh, thank you, Dr. Wilkins, Dennis, Andrea, for helping to coordinate um, so that we have this opportunity to learn. So thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you.